Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Analyzing Anfield, your tactics and analytics podcast, courtesy of the Blood Red channel. I'm Josh Williams and I'm joined by David Hughes as ever. Dave, how are we getting on, mate? Yeah, good, mate. Thanks. I've had an haircut, so I'm in a good mood. <laughs> well, I, haven't. I haven't. Even though we're out of lockdown, I'm still waiting another 20 days, sadly, so I'll probably get to caveman level again. What? When are you, you going to get it done? I'm not you until the 22nd. 20 seconds? Yeah. Why so late? Is that because you're waiting for Christmas cut, are you? Yeah, Christmas cut, yeah. Uh, mm. Anyway, this is a football podcast. So yeah. we'll be talking about Wolves, looking ahead to Wolves today. And funny enough, because of how the, the schedule's working out, there's actually been three Liverpool matches since we last recorded. So rather than addressing each game individually like we would usually do, I'm just going to gloss over Ajax and Brighton. Um, and pick up on like the key talking points during the games and that sort of thing rather than analyzing specifically how the matches went obviously we know the results uh so whether it'll be a shorter podcast or not remains to be seen but we will we'll, we'll get on with it and see how we go so um first of all dave brighton mm. um bad i didn't didn't like the game at all thought it was a terrible game um one of the ways we've played to be fair, we did paint Brighton as a, a well-coached team who can't put the ball in the net. And to an extent, I think it played out a bit like that. But um, I think up until, obviously, the, something like the 93rd minute, Liverpool had a 1-0 lead. I think it's safe to say if Liverpool would have escaped with that 1-0 lead, it, it would have been an escape. It would have been undeserved for me. I don't know about yourself. Yeah. I, I wasn't sure which way you were going to kind of paint it. Um on reflection, I probably should have known, but yeah, they did see a narrative that afterwards that was formed on the back of conceding a late penalty. Um, that you know it was kind of bad luck for Liverpool, but I think the reality is if you kind of look at the whole game, um, you know it wasn't it wasn't a great performance. I mean, we'll just reference the big caveat in that there was you know there's, there's injuries to the side and the starting 11 wasn't liverpool's best by any means um i did think they did okay in part liverpool um but you can say that they can see the two penalties um six shots all game and half of them come in the open 10 minutes of the match um you know it's just that alone you can see that it wasn't a great performance and you could probably i mean if we're being honest quite fortunate to even get a point uh, because Two, you know, two penalties, one missed, and um, didn't create a ton of chances. You know, it was quite fortunate, maybe, to even get the point. Yeah, I mean, like, that can be captured by the expected goals on the day. So the expected goals: Brighton two point one, and Liverpool zero point five. So in most cases, that's a two 0 win, really. Um, obviously, a lot of Brighton's two point one was the fact that they had penalties. So something like 1.6, 1.5 of Brighton's will have originated from penalties. So if you remove that, it was kind of a bit of a dead game, really. I suppose it was, a, you know, lots between both boxes, but then both teams maybe struggling to convert what they were, what they were generating in terms of progression, struggling to convert that into shots. Uh, Brighton had nine on the day. Liverpool had six. Um... I'll double check in a sec, but I'm pretty sure six will be right near the bottom of Liverpool's season so far for matches. Uh, I think Liverpool tend to average about 16 a game. So to post six, obviously not very good. Um, but yeah, I think I think the reason I'm being straight with it and, and saying that, you know, it would have been nice to get the win and it was a good finish when it was taken but it, it was undeserved it was because you know the penalties that were given the first one in particular was a definite penalty um the goal that liverpool scored obviously it comes from one of six shots which is not enough to take really in the game if you're taking six shots and you win the game you know you're getting a lucky break there um and we don't usually do refereeing calls but what, what was your thoughts on the second pen dave yeah i thought thought it was a penalty to be honest i, I don't necessarily agree in that I, these kind of incidents do get awarded as penalties. Ideally, I'd like to just see those kind of incidents across the board not be a penalty. But you know, you've kind of I, I, I think Salah got one very similar against West Ham. Was it Salah? Um, yeah, 
Yeah. Um, I actually think there was a little bit more contact on the Salah one, but um, they do they do get given. Unfortunately, I think the way Welbeck's gone down has made made it made it a, a little bit of a tough one to swallow because he's he's clearly able to stand up and he, he feels the contact and then falls to the floor. But the way things are at the moment, they do get awarded as, as penalties with VAR. So, you know, as a wider discussion, I don't think they should be penalties. But as things are, I think that was a penalty in my opinion. Yeah, I think for me it was it was a proper VAR penalty. I thought it was mm. one of them that you know without VAR in football, I don't think that ever gets given. Mm. Um, with VAR in football, once you slow that down, hundred percent penalty because it, it looks it looks like he's just volleyed them in the box really, doesn't it? Mm. Um, so it was one of them. It's it's never a penalty without VAR. With VAR, you absolutely can't argue with that. Uh, if you're in Andy Robinson's position, probably a little bit. Uh, Devastating, really, because he's he, he's. Bit, would you even say? I don't even think he's challenged. I, th- I think he's just gone to clear the ball. Yeah, he's connected with the man. So I saw the one of them happened. Although there was a lot more contact, so I'm not comparing the two as such. But one of them happened with Everton early in the season, where Gomez went to clear the ball from a corner, and Wilson just kind of gets in between, uh, and it, it's not yeah. even an attempt to challenge, but. It's just, you know, unfortunately, it's a, it's a penalty. The only thing I want to touch on really quick before we, we, we move on is that is the frustrating thing a little bit. I don't even want to have a VAR debate because, you know, we don't really do it. Um, but one thing we probably should acknowledge is Liverpool did create two big chances and ultimately scored two goals, didn't they? That were ru- ruled out. Um, and they were very, very close. And you kind of think, you know, they get... They get omitted, don't they? Um, and yet they kind of get chalked off as it never happening. But if they were just a you know a few centimeters uh, difference, they would have been quite two good constructed goals that didn't obviously didn't register. Where there's that penalty um, is a little bit of a tough one to take. Gets called because of our. It just kind of feels like VAR almost is rewarding things like that penalty incident but then really good passages of play get chalked off because of yeah it's a know, game, isn't it? yeah it just doesn't feel fair does it like a goal has now come from that bit of a nothing moment in the box because that was never going to lead to a goal that little passage of play was it but then something that was really well constructed has been chalked off and no goal has been awarded because of a few centimeters i think it is definitely flawed in that sense yeah, no, it's a good point. I think you know we've spoken in the past about what how how important it is to get good performance in the cases. You know, with that being posting high xG, posting lots of shots, restricting the opposing team to few shots and a low xG. And the better you do that, the more you kind of cover your own back for these random moments, like luck, like refereeing decisions. But I think now you can add VAR to that list, really, because it, it mm. can just out of nowhere punish you based off something that isn't really a thing, almost. Like, anyone that's, you know, followed XG and stuff like that will know that a penalty is usually converted about 76% of the time. So you're, you're awarding 76% of a goal f- for a clearance whereby, where he connects with the end of Welbeck's foot. So... And then, as you said, a well a well constructed move with that finishes with Salah putting the ball in the net. Maybe he's a toe offside or whatever it was gets choked off. So I I'd, I would agree with you in terms of like you know the, I think the game is a little bit flawed at the minute, but that's why this these performance indicators are so integral because the better you get them, the better your performance is, the more you compensate yourself um, for these random moments. But I think in the in the Brighton game. I don't think many Liverpool players particularly play to the usual standard. Obviously, it was quite a bit of rotation. But um, what are your thoughts on? I mean, I want to be, I want to stress that it's it still feels early. Mm. But w- w- what are your early thoughts, Dave, on on Takumi Minamino? Um, because Liverpool don't make bad signings in it since Klopp's been been at the helm at least, and Minamino signed. Just under a year ago now, um, mm. obviously we had six months off with or a few months off with the uh, the coronavirus lockdown and stuff. Mm. Um, but I think you know, with it being eleven months at the club now, 
the jury's still out. I think that's safe to say. Yeah, totally agree. Um, I'd, look, it, it's difficult to come in that winter window, isn't it? And to come in such a such a good side, certainly at the back end of last year. Um, you know, it's hard to kind of break that attacking trio up uh, and find a spot or even, you know, be played as a number eight. But you, you have to compare the impact he's had compared to Jota. Um, okay, Jota is a quite extreme example because he's been so impressive, but you'd kind of want to just see some influence and you just don't, not having it, you know, Liverpool having a lot of issues in terms of a really hectic schedule, players getting injured a lot, there's a need to rotate and he's getting kind of a minimal amount of action in Bright- against Brighton again. I don't really think he did enough. It goes back to that saying, I guess, Josh, you know, when you talk about players who don't uh, push the needle enough towards a win or, you know, influence the game enough, I don't think he does that. Um, and he just looks a little bit off it, a little bit lightweight, a little bit too nice. Um, and that's why I think he's struggling a little bit. The only good thing is, and this is something we said at the at the time, didn't we? He didn't cost a lot of money. He was a kind of low risk investment. So if it doesn't work out, you know, it's not like Liverpool have kind of blew a, a huge proportion of of the transfer kitty on him. Yeah, I think that the fact that he only costs seven and a bit million obviously covers Liverpool quite a bit. And I think if it was to not work out, um, and Liverpool was to sell him. There's, there's no way we get we we have to accept less than that. I think we're probably even selling for more. To be honest, despite his period at Liverpool so far not being that great, but yeah, I think you can look at each Liverpool player in the squad and just kind of usually quickly evaluate what this player offers specifically in terms of his main strength. Like even say for example the player that you could argue Mina Mina was replaced in Adam Lallana. I think what Lallana offered when he used to come on, even as a substitute. He just provide a bit of glue, you know, he's good in tight spaces, Lallana, he can handle getting pressured, um, keeps the ball, nice technical player. Um, so if Liverpool were kind of having a messy game whereby the ball wasn't sticking, you could put Lallana on. And obviously, on the pressing side, Lallana's quite keen on that side as well. But I think, I think Mino Mino, I'm not really sure what the perk is of using him at the minute. Um, mm. I'd say he's very intense off the ball, but... His intensity, I don't think is... I think it, it maybe stems from his desire to do well. But I think sometimes he just gives away fouls and that's not the way Liverpool do things. That's not... Liverpool have, for years, under Klopp, finished like top of the fair play leagues and stuff and we give away the fewest fouls usually, despite being a pressing team. Um, so you're given the opportunity for the opposition to get out and get a breather if you put a foul in. I mean, Amino seems to do that a little bit when he's trying to do, essentially, I suppose, what Firmino does. Um, mm. But he, against Brighton, I wasn't even sure what he was playing. I wasn't sure whether he he was playing in midfield, whether he was playing as a 10. Um, and I think he was signed as kind of a a bit of a blank slate that you could just mould to any situation. You know, he's quite a he's a bit like a Firmino and Wijnaldum type player, isn't he? But without the same level of quality mm. so you're kind of using them in holes that you need them um but in each in each role he's been given so far i don't really think he's shown his best side um to the yeah one. yeah yeah i agree it's um if, the thing you notice know, when you when you kind of watch liverpool is there's such a fluidity across that certainly those front positions isn't there you know like the eights going into the the kind of three forwards um, and the constantly kind of interchanging, but they, they always seem to have an understanding that if one player is in one area of the pitch, then I need to be here. Even if that's not my position, that's how it works. You know, you kind of keep some sort of structure and he does just seem to get a little bit lost within those movements sometimes. You know, he's, he's sometimes he's a little bit too close to another player or he hasn't taken up the space that they vacated. Um, whether that's just adjusting to those kind of intricacies of the tactical play, I don't know. But um, he's the kind of player at the moment that when you see him on the team sheet, you're not hugely confident, are you? Um, that he's going to be someone who can kind of positively influence the game. If you compare him to, say, like, you know, 
players who've come into the side over the last 12 months, if you compare them to a shot at all, even like Curtis Jones, you know, he's basically kind of come into the side and he's someone that you have confidence with at the moment that he'll come in and can have an, an impact on the team. And as I said, I just don't think we're kind of seeing that in Minamino at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I've just messaged it on GTS, his, um, his passing network from the day. To be honest, I expected ways. It, it doesn't look that bad. It looks quite, you know, like like he's been a bit of a link player of sorts. Mm. Um, and he's, he's kind of everywhere. Um, I, I, again, it's difficult to nail him down to a set position. I've not that passing network. Mm. Um, what I will say is that a lot of the passes are sideways. Not 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 many of them are, um, you know, through the lines, if you like. Um, mm. But I don't know. He's, he's used to play that. I'm always willing to give time to, to these mm. Liverpool signs since since we've got Klopp in, but he's a player that I, I will admit that I do think he's he's not having a great period. Mm. I think obviously his his, um, his arrival at Liverpool has been massively disrupted by everything that's happened. Um, I, don't, I don't think he's yet to play, or he hasn't played much in front of the actual Liverpool fans yet, stuff like that. But I don't know from the tactical side of things and. You know the data side as well. He just feels a bit beige at the minute. He just feels like a bit of a, you know, I think he used to wear before, but a little bit lightweight, um, not having too much of an impact, and any impact that he is having is probably swaying towards the negative side rather than the positive side in terms of moving the needle towards winning. So, yeah, just to keep him with him. just on a another point, maybe not so much just focusing solely on the pitch. Does he speak fluent English? Do we know? I'm not sure. Uh, I'd be I'd be surprised if he doesn't, because yeah. that would that would be quite a hurdle for him to overcome. Um, mm. But the reason I ask, sure. yeah, is it? It's really difficult to gauge our our players kind of adapting, you know, behind the scenes because we're just not privy to that that kind of footage or you know the stuff that goes on when the doors are closed type thing or on the training ground, but. He does kind of strike, and I could be way off, and that, this isn't me saying I know it is, I'm just guessing, but he does strike me as someone that maybe doesn't feel like he's fully integrated. He looks like he'd be quite a, a, a quiet character. Yeah. Um, and there was a, there's something I remember when Liverpool won the title and it was confirmed. And I'm pretty sure I've seen some footage, maybe others can back it up, who's listening and watching, where he is in one of the baths after the game. Uh, on his own and all the coaching staff kind of run in and pile in and jump in with him um, and start like you know like splashing water about was having a big like laughing joke shouting his name and things but again reading between lines I just think if the coaching staff are doing that and you're kind of on your own at the time you couldn't have, I just don't think you could see that happening with maybe like a Van Dyke or a Henderson you know what I mean you feel like it'd all be the players and even like yeah do you understand the point I'm trying to make? Like, even like a caterer who's in and out of the side can't get a good run in the team. You know, it, it, there's always like the nabby lad, and you know he seems to be kind of really integral within the squad still. And I just don't feel like I'm seeing that with Minamino. And I wonder if that, on top of not having the best performances on the pitch, is making it really difficult for him to settle into the into Liverpool and the squad. Yeah, I think I think he needs a, he needs a run. He needs a bit of a good run, but. He's yet to have it. He's been in and out since he signed. Um, I do think that's what he was signed for. I've honest. I think I've mentioned this a few times before, but I think the way Jota was signed as kind of like an heir to the throne. Um, I think Mina Mino was squad was signed as a, a squad player, as you know, a, a player who can just, as I said, that adaptable profile that you can just put anywhere and he'll just do a job and fit the identity of the the playing style. Um, so I do think he was he was bought for that. I don't think it's a big disaster that it that it hasn't worked yet. Because mm. I think even if it had worked brilliantly, I still don't think he would have played that many more minutes than he has. Because mm. I, I just think there's players ahead of him. I don't think he's got the the level of quality that Jota has, whereby Jota could actually make an impact and start regularly starting as a starting eleven player. I think Mina Mina would have to do quite a lot for that to happen. But you know, even despite that, I just think it's worth talking about because um, there's probably quite a few question marks out there. And I think I don't want to be too harsh, but but the the way I describe what I've seen so far from it's it's he's kind of performed as like a bit of a 
bad version of Firmino. Lots of Firmino's game, but if Firmino was having an off day, let's say so, not linking the play as well, trying to press but making fouls, um, first touch is a little bit questionable at times. Just, just, just I, do you see what I'm saying there? Yeah, no, I do. Yeah, yeah. kind of like a, a light version of him for me. Now, so all the stuff that for me now does so good that makes him the player he is. He's kind of a replica of it, but isn't really producing that kind of high calibre of contributions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I do think he was signed as that. I do I do think it was a kind of, you know, we need a player who's like Firmino who can come in and give Bobby a break. Um, and I think they've probably nailed it to, to an extent, but I think he could do a lot of what Firmino does without the quality, but but still with the you know the efficiency maybe is the word that I'm after. Mm. But he's he's just looking like a bit of a reckless version of Firmino who makes worse decisions and stuff. But I don't know. I'm maybe I'm probably being a bit too harsh, but I just thought on the back of the Brighton game, maybe it's worth talking about because we we've kind of overlooked him a bit since he signed. Mm. Um, yeah. One other aspect from the game was I had a close eye on Ben White, um, and he was up against. In Brighton's system, he was kind of up against Jota, and I thought he he did really really well throughout the game. I thought he kept him really quiet. He was really tight to him. Whenever Jota received the ball, White was you know firmly stepping on his toes and stuff like that. Obviously, Jota ended up scoring, but I think it, for White it was a good um you know a good kind of audition word, audition audition mm. yeah. Um, and I think Klopp would have been quite impressed by by the. You know the traits of his game that that you could say applies to Liverpool's game. Mm, yeah, you know he's one that's well talked about. Um, he kind of has all the right attributes, and yeah, I agree. I think he done he done well in that match, and I think that kind of um, no matter how much scouting you do, and I, I'm no Klopp trusted staff. I think it'd be good for him to watch him live against you know top caliber forwards and put in a good performance. I think that won't do us chances any harm if he if he is on a potential kind of transfer shortlist and maybe one of the options Liverpool might pursue over the next 12 months. Yeah, I mean, I will say, I think it's unlikely. I think considering how much he's going to cost, obviously Leeds were offering around £30 million for him and I think they just they still knocked it back Brighton. So Liverpool, I assume, would have to go towards the 40 mark. And although he's homegrown and stuff, which has got its own squad perks, I do think that Liverpool are more inclined to think we can get better value elsewhere, but I just thought it was a good little, good little audition for him. Um, and then one final point from the previous games. We can't not talk about Curtis Jones. Um, I thought he was the best player on the pitch against against Ajax, apart from a certain certain goalkeeper. See the game, Dave. Yeah. Well, I saw the. Um... I was watching the under 18s first, and then I watched the kind of the last uh, 35 minutes when I got home. He the, the keeper performed really, really well. Um, I'm not even going to attempt his first name, but I know his name is Kelleher. Um, and little fun fact that I'm going to throw out there now to our analyzing and field listeners. I'm not saying I'm responsible for his performance, but me and him go to the same barber. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, name the barbers. <laughs> yeah. That, 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 that'll be why you team. can't get into the 20 seconds because you've got all the, uh, the players going in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember them telling me, and I, I, I just saw his name on the team sheet. My first thought was haircuts <laughs> over mm-hmm. everything else. Um, but yeah, Curtis Jones, I think he's shown up early days, obviously, but I think he's shown up as a bit of an output player, Dave, because um, mm. I think he's doing a lot. I think he's you one of them who's a bit like um a bit involved with everything. Yeah. Yeah, the uh I know she's twenty three and uh it was like a data platform. I don't know if they shared it or I think maybe it might be Sam McGuire who, who showed me, but he he, he done one of the, like a com- comparison radar and it was uh with Kevin De Bruyne this season. And we're only talking eight hundred minutes versus six hundred minutes, but um the output was almost identical in every department. Might be worth us one of us just trying to find that and share it on social so people can have a look. But yeah, that's exactly what he is. He's mm. what I really like about him is he's just he's uh he's so versatile and kind of fulfills 
the role required wherever he plays. You know, he can kind of go in one of those wide positions in the front three if needed, and he'll contribute, you know, like chance creation or goals, or he can go into the midfield the way he has been doing, um, you know, and play like his... Against Ajax, he was like a, a number eight, wasn't he? Um, and he just he can go in there and again make stuff happen. He's just a, he's just such an. It, it, it's really interesting for me to see because I watched them coming. I watched them for the under 18s and I watched them kind of come through when he was playing under Gerard. And um, if you think of everything he offers in terms of output, um, then you've got like his versatility, his age, his nationality. You, you know what would Liverpool have to pay? For the player like that in the market now. Um with all those things considered, it'd be easy, I think, 35, 40 million, maybe more, I don't know. Um yeah. I'm just pulling figures, but Liverpool basically brought that through for nothing. Um at a really good time as well, because I think they needed that extra kind of midfielder like that in the team, especially this season of all season. And uh, he's been brilliant to be honest, Josh. Yeah, I think he's I think he's a real product as well of the Academy. I think um since since Klopp took charge, that is, I think since Klopp took charge, he was really intense on getting the kids to play exactly like the first team, so that once the kids come through, they can just slot in seamlessly. And I think although Trent has come through before him, Trent is, I wouldn't really label Trent as a Klopp player. He's he's a bit more of a a Guardiola type, I think. Trent, um, a bit more of a possession based player who, but I think I think Curtis Jones is is more of a a club type player in terms of you know being very very versatile very intense very physical um clearly a very strong mentality and a bit of an all-round game in terms of you know with and without the ball he, he's, he's a solid contributor i think in terms of his, his profile i think he's a bit of a weird blend of a number of different liverpool midfielders i think he's got aspects of henderson one album cater about him, but kind of a bit of a you know a cocktail of 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 those players. I think he's probably a bit less defensively active as Henderson, but probably a bit more offensive minded than him. Um, probably offers a bit more in the final third than Henderson does. Um, and yeah, I just think he's you know if you look at his numbers and stuff, he, he does look like he's contributing to a, to a number of areas. He's not one of them. Them weird data players like a Wayne Allen, for example, who, when you look at his data profile, it looks like he's doing pretty much nothing. If you look at Jones' numbers, you, you can see the contributions in a number of different areas. You know, moving the ball to the final third, taking shots, dribbling past players, tackling players, all that sort of stuff. So, um, I think in terms of you know Klopp's perspective on like total football and stuff, when we've got the ball, everyone's an attacker. When, when we've lost the ball, everyone's a defender. I think it looks like Jones is, is really well suited to that. Yeah, yeah, I agree totally. Um, thought it was a good point that you mentioned there. That I just want to elaborate a bit further on because uh, you talked about the fact that he's come through the academy and it makes that transition so much easier. And I think that's why uh, Kelleher played over Adrian uh, this week against Ajax because, um, and in fact, he might even be Liverpool's number two, number two now until they bring in a replacement. It might be the end of Adrian, which you know, Josh, I, I probably see you doing somersaults off camera there in a minute. Um, but you know, <laughs> to be honest, when I seen Keller hit in the starting eleven, I just went outside, got in the car, started revving the engine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's uh, a <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> The thing is, he's a. Uh, what I will say is, he's not. I don't think he he done well against Ajax, but I don't think he's truly tested from like a shot stopping perspective. And, you know, if you think of some of the games he's played in over the last twelve months or so, he has conceded a lot of goals. But I'm not putting that on him. Um, you can see the five against Arsenal, didn't he, and five against Villa. But I don't necessarily blame him for them because I think we just haven't seen enough of him in that regard, and there isn't enough to d- data to support him. But you know, you talked about the academy, didn't you? And that's one thing that he's be, he's come through the academy and what they've been getting read in the academy, the goalkeepers is passing out from the back. You know, the even under 18 level, probably lower as well, but, you know, we don't get to see that. But I think all the 18 keepers, it's all about get, playing short from goal kicks, receiving the ball from defenders, playing out from the back. And I think he he's obviously been doing that for a number of years at, at, at youth level. 
he's coming into this Liverpool side who demand that. Whereas Adrian has, has come in and he just hasn't really got that same kind of ability with the ball's feet. In fact, I think he's often a liability with the ball's feet. He's forever knocking the ball out of play and we've seen him give it away a few times, leading to goals against. And I think that's the, the key difference. Adrian could be a marginally better shot stopper, although even that's debatable. But I think that's why he come in, in on, on Tuesday because he can he can play out from the back and he's decent with the ball as feet, whereas Adrian isn't. And it's just, again, another kind of testament or to, to to the academy and why why it's so important to have that kind of alignment between the first team and the 23s and 18s. Yeah, I mean, the, the way he performed, I think Alisson's out for, for the weekend game, so... The way he performed, I don't think you can take him out. <clears throat> I think he has to stay in. Um, he was called upon. He did make big saves with the ball at his feet. He made absolutely zero mistakes, flaws. If, if he, to be honest, if he was playing, you know, as a shadow, I would have thought it was Allison. It, and that's, that's the biggest compliment I can give him. Um, there, was, there was one specific moment where he, he launched the counter attack with a throw uh, over his head and over the head throw, and it was it was. The execution was flawless on the throw. It was a really well, te- you know, technically flawless uh, throw. Um, and yeah, the way he performed, it was it was really impressive. Um, so I, I think maybe the only the only downside he's got on on Adzi, and I think he's he's less he's got less of a stature on the physical side. And you know, part of me wonders whether that come into it, considering we were facing Ajax, you know, a gang of youngsters as it is anyway, not the biggest side. From a corner kick, probably I actually going to play it short. From a free kick wide, they're not going to pose the biggest aerial threat, maybe sort of thing. Apart from a pair of shares. um, but yeah, it, I, I just don't think. I think even if he was brought in to just play the Champions League game because it was Ajax, and then back to the weekend we're going to bring Adzi in. I'm just not sure you can the way he played it. I think he's got to stay in for me, mm. um, and that will be for the game against Wolves, which we're going to talk about now. So, usually it's a tricky game. Um, to be honest, Liverpool tend to do okay against them. Liverpool tend to beat them. But they're just, they're just never the side wolves that I look forward to playing. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure about you, Dave. Yeah, because yeah, cause even Liverpool's record is fairly decent against them, but they, they never hammer them. You know, it's never the, it's never like a kind of a, a dominance, um, you know, three or four nil score line. It... it it wolves are the side who tend to defend well, uh, make it really difficult for you to score against them, and pose a lot of threat on the counter. So, you know, stylistically, they're they're the kind of not the best matchup for Liverpool because, yes, Liverpool will dominate. That's what they're used to. You know, they'll see a lot of the ball, they'll be it spend a lot of time in the Wolves half, but Wolves are quite comfortable sitting back and allowing that, um, and it's the threat on the counter that's that's going to be a problem. Um, so it's definitely not. Not an easy game by any stretch. Yeah, I mean, looking at the numbers, funnily enough, they're they're just in and around seventh for Everton, and they seem to have been that since they achieved promotion. They just they don't really seem to have um, reached a a level yet whereby they're they're pushing for Champions League, but they never drop below a certain point either. I think in Mm. terms of games, when you're playing against them as well, I mean, I think they randomly lost 4-0 the other week to, to West Ham. But other than that, I can't think of many games whereby Wolves lose by more than more than one goal. They mm. always seem to be in it. In and around the hour mark, it's always usually level. And they end up sneaking a winner or, you know, they might be getting beat 1-0, winning 1-0. It's, their games are always in the balance, I find. And I think mm. that's why when it comes to these numbers that I'm going to reel off, it's it's difficult to to sum up Wolves, I think, because I think a lot of their game stems from the game state. So I don't think they're inclined to overcommit. I think when they get a lead, they sit on it. Um, so they're, diff- they're quite a tricky team to analyse. So the seventh in the table, seventeenth for expected goals, which I was surprised by, um, because the seventeenth for expected goals, but the sixth for shots. Um, and usually the two tens of correlate. So when I went, I, I then immediately went and looked at expected goals per shot because they must be taking bad shots from bad locations. But 
it's 0.09. So that's an average of 9% pay shot. Liverpool's is about 13%. Um, 0.09 for perspective is the same as Man United at the minute in the Premier League. I don't think it's, the, I think it's just below mid table. Um, but I think one of the reasons why the 17th for expected goals is because they've had no penalties yet. Uh, zero penalties. Quite a few teams who are above them have probably benefited from a penalty. And as I said before, a penalty is 0.76 XG, so 76% of a goal. So that's that's quite a bit. So that does give you a boost. Um, and then on the defensive side of the game, as you'd expect with Wolves, they are you know, towards the top end, seventh for expected goals against. Um, so any surprises there, Dave, or or you know what you'd expect? No, even the um, I think the, the being quite low on the expected goals is is a little bit. I, I thought he'd be a little bit higher, more around mid table, but it's still all quite tight there, isn't it? And you rightly point out the penalties, but no, that's that's kind of what they are. I think Wolves are quite content with sticking with the one philosophy uh, of how they play. Like, I think even the most casual of fan, football fan, would have a, a decent idea of how Wolves set up and how they play. Um, but it's still quite effective because every team that they come up against will know how they play and they still get results, um, which shows why it's so effective. Um, the, the, the kind of a core group who've been together for a while now um, I just think they're quite happy to just keep solidifying these kind of top seven finishes and and being a a, a decent side um, and continue doing that and then maybe in the next year or two you might see them when they feel comfortable enough kind of try and make that next step up because sometimes I think teams in the past have been um, tempted to do that and it's kind of backfired and they've not progressed and, and instead they've regressed and I just think Wolves are quite content to solidify a few you know top six top seven finishes and then and then maybe we'll see some sort of adaptation in the in the future but yeah not surprises me by that it's going to be a tough game um, and probably it's going to be a tight one as well yeah I mean looking at the numbers the expected goals numbers without penalties moved them up to 12th yeah, um, that's where I expect them to be. Yeah, um, very, very similar per 90 average to Brighton and Arsenal. So we're, we're dealing with a kind of Brighton slash Arsenal attack, if you like. Um, to be honest, I'm quite surprised they have another penalty this season because they've got quite a few tricky attackers that I think are going to cause Liverpool a bit of a problem. Um, obviously, Raul Jimenez is out. Um on the back of that, the head injury. Um, he's obviously a top, top player who, who has given Liverpool problems in the past, scored against Liverpool. But from the perspective of the defence, you could argue they've got an equally tricky prospect now presented to them because they're probably going to be up against a very fluid front three, I think, in probably Podens, um, Neto and Traore, I would expect. A lot of pace there, Dave. Um, and Liverpool, obviously, without Gomez, Van Dijk, and we've moved in Massive and Fabinho. So I know we've put this forward in the past with the likes of Werner, and Liverpool haven't really struggled too much against these tricky fast players, but that's a quick front line, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. And, you you know, if, if Fabio Silva plays as well, he, he still feels like a little bit of a unknown quantity. Like, he's, he's, he's high, highly rated. I know he's still young, but he was highly rated, wasn't he, before he he come to Wolves? Um, and you do start wondering with these players when they when they get an opportunity to to play more, um, if they're gonna kind of really grab try and grasp it by by both hands and be a little bit fearless and pose some real issues. So I, I, I do think that you know the players they've got, um, they could they could they could hurt Liverpool genuinely. Um I think it could be a a tough game. I think you're right in what you said in that we've said this before. You know, we've we've kind of put warnings on teams and Liverpool have handled it quite well. And Liverpool do have a knack of doing that. They they kind of manage to exceed expectations and they could quite do do so again here. But certainly on paper, pre match, there's players who have the potential to cause Liverpool problems. Particularly in transition. I think yeah. um that's tends to be what Wolves do. That's why they turn these tricky fast players who are good on the break 
because they do sense it's so, so pressure. They really tend to uh, press high up the field. They'll probably allow Liverpool to have the ball. They'll assume a bit of a mid-block type thing. Um, and they'll, they'll kind of force Liverpool into into making mistakes, really. Um, and once doing that, they'll look to break into space, which in the past Liverpool have been better suited to cope with. And now, not so much because of the, the different players that we have in defence. So it'll be interesting to see how we do here, because this is one of the best transition teams in the in the country, I think. Um, funnily enough, one thing Wolves have done recently, which I expect to change against Liverpool, they've, they've randomly moved to a back four. Um, I did read earlier in the season, could have sworn I read something along the lines of Wolves wanting to become a more dominant team with the ball and stuff like that. I have not seen any evidence of it at all. <laughs> he moved to a uh, a back four the previous game because Connor Cody was out. Connor Cody came back in against Arsenal, but I, I think they kept the back four. I think it was a four two three one. Um, yeah, they did. Yeah, wh- whether that happens against Liverpool, I'm not sure. Um, that probably stems from Wolves not being particularly fearful of Arsenal's attack. Um, but in terms in terms of the, the Wolves' defence. Connor Cody is a player that Liverpool fans really like still. Uh, and there's there's always plenty of calls for him to, to be brought home and all that sort of stuff. What are your thoughts on that, Dave? Because I'm I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that, I don't think that's that's a deal that would make too much sense, even being honest with you. I think he uh I think while he's a central defender and he's a good central defender, you know, there's different types of players for different systems and he suits their system where there's I don't think he'd suit Liverpool's. I think as a player, he likes to play to be ahead of him. Um, he likes to kind of be a deep line defender. He's not really suited, you know, to running in behind or playing on the halfway line. And I just think his his attributes are better suited to Wolves' system. I think he could quickly get punished and exposed if he was in the Liverpool central defence. You know, having to play on the halfway line again, running behind and things. Yeah, I think that's probably a good way of putting it. Um, I think he's. I think it'd be an emotional sign if we was mm. to bring him back. A bit like Everton. Everton come to mind, Dave, with, with Rooney and mm. you know, that sort of thing. He didn't really need Rooney. He didn't really offer that much when he came. I think can't really remember too much to be honest. But I mean, he finished the uh, top scorer, but there was about eight penalties in there. I think so. Yeah, there's yeah, massive. Yeah, about fourteen number tens that he. Was <laughs> <playing>. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I think I think it would be an emotional sign because I think if you look at his suitability to what Liverpool do, I don't think he's suited. Um, mm. I think he's now 27 years old anyway. Um, but he is a player who likes the ball to be ahead of him. He likes to retreat a little bit and not have too much space in behind. Not the most suited to defending wide open spaces. Not the best when it comes to defending, defending 1v1 against top quality forwards. And you need to tick those boxes for Liverpool. And I think on the aerial side, I think I looked at the numbers last season. I think 49 centre-backs played over 1,500 minutes in the Premier League last season. I think Cody finished 37th for aerial success. Um, I think he's about six foot one. So, good player. Really, really vocal. Great personality. Um, makes more sense for England, I think, than, than Liverpool. And... A good player, really mm-hmm. good on the ball, good with the long passes and stuff, but suitability to what Liverpool do, the high-risk game, you have to be a really complete, well-rounded centre-back to be of interest to Liverpool, and I'm not sure Cody, Cody is that. Um, on the opposite side, I think Jota, who is obviously going to be playing his former team, probably is is the difference in in terms of that. In terms of being more suited to Liverpool's game than Wolves' game, uh, and I think it's you know it's interesting how how that tends to work out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems bonkers now, doesn't it? Really, to think that at the start of the season he wasn't actually even playing in the Wolves side, like he, he wasn't in the starting eleven when he's kind of come in and been such a such a huge success so far at Liverpool. But you are right, you know he he is he's. At, at, at Wolves, as as we'll see from the players who were in his positions on Sunday, um, 
he was kind of tasked with sitting in a little bit more, doing more off the ball work. Um, and then when possession was one, he was one of the players who was expected to, you know, carry it quickly forwards, move the ball quickly forwards. Uh, but at Liverpool, you know, we, we know he's such a threat in the attack and third, as we've seen. He can be closer to the goal for longer periods and he's presented with more shooting opportunities. And he seemed like the type of player who will give you a huge return when you increase his output. Um, you know, two statistics I noticed that have changed. One is, you know, he, at last year he was averaging, um, well, yeah, so he, he was averaging just under four progressive runs per 90 at Wolves. So far at Liverpool, that's dropped to three. Um, and obviously he's cl- he gets closer to the goal for Liverpool more frequently. So that's given him extra shooting opportunities. He's he's averaging an extra shot per 90 for Liverpool so far compared to Wolves last season. And yeah, as you said, Josh, he's just, he's a player who's better suited to, well, not better suited because he's done a really good job at Wolves, but there's a reason why he's been able to, scale up his, his output because, and score more goals now that he's had a side who create more chances. Yeah, I mean, I do think he was suited to Wolves' game. I think he's, he is really good in transition. He's good on the break, really quick, comfortable carrying the ball, um, quite a counter-attack and player. But I think at Liverpool, as you said, he's just going to get more of those opportunities. Liverpool have got more possession. And I think particularly without the ball, I think he's now a lot more suited in terms of wanting to press, wanting to be aggressive, less inclined to be a Wolves type player, really. You know, Wolves Wolves do retreat, Wolves do um, allow opposing teams to have the ball in their defensive third and then kind of break once a mistake happens. So for him to now be at Liverpool, able to be aggressive, able to press high up the field, close opponents down, I do think he's a lot more suited to Liverpool's game and um, it'll be interesting to see how he does because obviously he's going up against opponents that he will know their weaknesses. I suppose they will know his as well. But it'll be interesting to see how he gets on because uh, I'm always intrigued when when little things like that come up. Mm. Um, but in terms of your verdict, then Dave, uh, how would you see this one going? Um, with it being an Anfield, I'm going to give the edge to Liverpool. I think if it was at Molyneux. It could be uh, maybe a draw. I'm still gonna. I still see it as a really tight game. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go with Liverpool two one. Um, yeah, in a, in, a, in a tight match, but one that Liverpool will get over the line. He seems to do a lot of two ones Liverpool, especially last season. And uh, I can see another one here. Yeah, I I'm gonna go with you with two one. Um, for mostly the same reasons. I, I was gonna say. A lot of it will depend on the, the team that Klopp picks. But I think this this is a game whereby Liverpool will have had five days break, which is good. Uh, we haven't really had that lately. Um, and I think, obviously, Wolves, without Jimenez, playing away from home. Um, I do think it'll be tough. I don't think they'll be watching it. And it'll probably follow the Wolves' theme, to be honest, of being more cagey in the first half and the second half and stuff. But... I, I do think Liverpool will, will scrape a win here and, and go with the two one. Um, the the, um, the good thing about this as well is because obviously the game afterwards, a few days later, Michelin, there's there's nothing riding on it now. It, it, it this is going to be Liverpool's proper break, I think, for the first time in a while for the key players at least because you, as you said, you got a five day break before that game, and then it's probably going to be nearly a week before the next game after that, isn't it? So it's it's kind of a it's, it's going to be, a, compared to what they've been having to pull up with and what's probably going to happen over the festive period, it's going to be like a like a hole before them almost. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think saying that Klopp will probably pick the best available team he can for Wolves, then literally play Pep Linders against Midtjylland <laughs> and then give, give the players get a week off and then they have to face, I think it's Fulham in the Premier League after a week mm. off. So, yeah, he'll probably go with the strongest team against Wolves. Um, unless certain players need a break, but after five days of rest, uh, I'd expect that to, I, I wouldn't anticipate that. So, yeah, I'm going to go 2 1 Liverpool, same as Dave, and uh, we will see next week if we were correct. So, uh, Dave, thanks for joining us, mate. Cheers, mate. Cheers, everyone. And we will be back next week. Cheers. <laughs>